Hello, this is Daniel and Ingrid with Peace and Plenty Farms and Daniel's Bullion Coins. We are a debt-free, self-sustaining, organic, closed-loop homestead with a touch of uh, off-grid. And we wanted to uh, come to you today and talk to you a little bit about uh, what we do and how we get to, uh, to be debt-free and self-sustaining. So I'm at the shop today and uh, I thought I would uh, tell you about uh, being debt free. It's not something that you just wake up one day and, and you're instantly debt free. You have to set out, have a plan and a purpose and the will to do it. There were many, two jobs, three jobs, uh, many, many long hours saving and scrimping and going without to um, save up the money and purchase property paid for and then to do the work necessary to get it livable same with cars you know to buy those cars um, and and do the work to maintain them myself it uh, doesn't just happen overnight it is a struggle and it's not just uh, if you are and you want to, the easy life the easy way to go then debt free is not to not for you but if you want to be uh, debt free and uh, have something in your retirement and not have to worry about uh, where your next meal is going to come from then put in a little bit of time now and you can enjoy that security later and while this is kind of in a rear view mirror aspect because we've gotten to the place where we're debt free and self-sufficient starting to be more self-sufficient I'd like to be able to uh, teach you what I've learned and, and show you the mistakes and uh, the ups and downs and that way you can maybe avoid some of the uh, pitfalls. One of the things about our farm is it's a closed loop environment. In other words, we feed the chickens with the uh, black soldier fly that we grow inside the rabbit manure. Now rabbit manure has an interesting um, property to it that it can be immediately put on your uh, plants as fertilizer or it can be immediately used as uh, black growing black soldier flies and one of the reasons why we like the uh, black soldier flies on the farm is because they deter the uh, house flies and where house flies will land on you on your face on your food uh, black soldier flies are skittish sort of like a fox they uh, they tend to stay away from humans and um, the larvae are really good for the um, chickens and the uh, catfish. We you know, feed them to the catfish, feed them to the uh, chickens. So we also grow our own feed in the uh, fodder house. We grow little sprouts in like a uh, hydroponic system where that's just the water circulating over the plants and uh, sprouting the seeds in the first um, couple of weeks of the sprout it's a lot of protein and the uh, chickens and the rabbits they get uh, plenty of protein that way so that's what we mean by the closed loop environment where we don't have to go out for feed and we don't have to go out um, for food because we can grow both meat and vegetables there on the farm it's our little homestead we do do a little bit of off-grid with the um, solar and uh, the hydro powered uh, systems that we'll be doing uh, videos on those in the future but right now I was going to talk a little bit about the uh, silver business and what we do with that so one of the big uh, reasons that um, we, we chose uh, to get into silver was because we could see the value of the dollar depreciating and you want to buy what is low and sell what is high so when we saw the market getting overblown and that was easy to do in in 06 07 to see the housing market exploding like it was and the housing bubble that was coming and once things started to um, implode we moved into the um, gold and silver business one of the things that I, I see a lot of places not uh, talking about is the fact that silver and gold are a storage of energy, effort, and time. It stores your energy like no other material. It doesn't rot. It doesn't decay. 
I mean, you can go out and be a carpenter and build a house for somebody, and eventually that house is going to need repairs and upkeep. And same with a car. You know, you can buy a car, but it's going to need repairs and upkeep. Uh, metal rust away, wood rots, but the coins just don't. They don't lose their um, property. So I like to tell it like this to people who come into the uh, shop. I, I tell them a story where you've got one person out digging silver out of the ground and another person panning gold on the side of the river and maybe somebody has a cow and they milk the cow for milk and another person um, raises chickens for the eggs and another person bakes bread well they come into town at the end of the week end of the day however you want to look at it and they trade an equal amount of time and energy for an equal time and energy in other words the person who bakes the loaf of bread they want to trade for an equal amount of time that it took to to dig the silver out of the ground same with uh, the gold they want to exchange equal effort for equal effort and uh, you can see the capitalism in that where if it gets easier to dig the gold out of the or dig the silver out of the ground people will gravitate towards the silver and then it will be, becomes harder and harder to get the silver out of the ground because there's less and less same with the um, making of bread if there's too many people that think it's easy to to make a loaf of bread and sell it then there will be a lot of people doing it and the price will come down so the price is controlled by capitalism by the free market and people venturing into whatever area and producing that product but silver and gold back to that um, so you have this small town let's say and people come into town at the end of the week and they trade their energy and their effort for the week and the person that's been productive that's been smart and applied themselves correctly is going to come out with the best uh, harvest whether it's grain for bread or silver and gold they're the ones that are going to come out the best because they've been the most productive. They've been thoughtful on what they were doing and they trade equal. Well, what happens eventually, and it's happened thousands of times throughout history, is there will be a fat man, I call him, sitting in town and he'll say, hey, I will come up with this currency, this paper currency, and just bring me your gold and silver and you can use um, my paper currency and I'll back my paper currency with gold and silver and that's fine everybody agrees with it at first because he promises never to stray from the gold and silver standard you can come into him at any time and trade your currency for uh, redeemable in gold and silver but eventually as time goes along they quietly and slowly come off of that standard and uh, for the U.S., uh, where we're at right now, we came off of the gold standard in 1933. That's how I describe it. And we came off the silver standard in 1971 when Nixon took us off the silver standard. We actually took silver out of our currency in 1964. Well, we went on the uh, oil standard. And we were on the oil, I look at it as we were on the oil standard really until about 2012 when we started quantitative easing. In other words, we backed our currency by the deposits of the taxpayers, where, in other words, we just add a zero to the computer and pay our bills with money created out of thin air. And you can see how that has picked up steam here recently, where now we are printing trillions and trillions of dollars and sending it out to people just because they're unemployed or there's been an economic hardship where before everybody had to endure and overcome those uh, hardships through um, effort and time and energy. So I think we're rapidly approaching the point where we have many times, thousands of times throughout history where we're coming to a point where people are going to quit accepting the dollar and we're going to go back to a gold and silver um, currency. 
So I just laid out um, some examples of uh, silver. We have the uh, silver dimes. This is $10 worth. This is $10 worth of quarters. This is $10 worth of uh, halves. And this is uh, $20 worth of the uh, Morgan silver dollars. And this is $20 worth of the uh, peace dollars. This is our current um, 1986 and newer one ounce. These are uh, three nines, 0.999 purity. And then some random bars. I really try to get people to shy away from the bars because if you go out to try to trade with somebody, you're back in that town and you want to trade, you need to know how much silver is in the coins that you're using. And you need to have that authentication. And the thing about a peace dollar is the fact that it's struck and made into a coin like this, you've got your authentication. People recognize that. They know that that's approximately three quarters of an ounce of silver right there. And it's the same for the dimes and the quarters and the halves. There's approximately uh, three quarters of an ounce of silver in each dollar. And there's pretty close to almost exactly one ounce of silver in each dollar forty. So you can have an ounce of silver at a dollar forty. So um, four quarters and four dimes would be a dollar forty, and that would be one ounce right there. And uh, people can exchange then and use it as currency. I've got all that written on my card right here, and I'll hold it up. You can get a screenshot of that. A lot of information written right there about um, the red is the 90% um, silver. Dimes, quarters, halves, morgans, and peace dollars. And then there's two exceptions to that rule. It's the um, Kennedy half dollars, which are the 40%, and then the war nickels, which are the 35%. Now, the Kennedy 40%, that is 2.95 ounces of silver per $10 roll. And then on the nickels, every $2 roll has 2.24, I'm sorry, 2.25 ounces of silver in each um, $2 roll of war nickels. So those are, those are just two of the exceptions, but people generally prefer the 90% silver or the one ounce silver. Um, I found that the bars really don't work so well when you're trying to um, trade for guns or ammo or tractor parts or food. People tend to uh, prefer the um, 90%. The dimes, of course, have the uh, incremental fungible advantage, so I, um, they have a little tiny bit of a premium on them. Incremental fungible advantage, incremental fungible advantage is just simply the fact that you have a hundred coins in ten dollars. You only have forty coins here, and you only have twenty coins here in uh, ten dollars. So you've got many more fractional capabilities. In other words, you can make change, um, you can negotiate with uh, the dimes better than you can, say, a dollar piece. Uh, that's why we had the uh, the pieces of eight back in the eighteen back in the seventeen hundreds. They would take a Spanish silver dollar and they would cut it into eight pieces, and uh, they would that would be uh, uh, pieces of eight eight pieces, and that's where you get two bits from. If you watch any of the westerns, they say, "Oh, two bits for a shave and a haircut." Well, that's what that's for. Just uh, some odds and ends, random uh, thoughts I thought I would give you on uh, gold and silver. When it comes to the gold, I really prefer the um, numismatic gold. Sorry, I had to grab some out of this. But I want to show you what I'm talking about. This is a gold 90% piece right here and it's these are going to be dated 1933 and older and this particular coin there are four advantages uh, I like to say uh, four birds for one stone uh, type what you've got is you've got the gold that's one and two is the fact that it's a coin and three the fact that it's numismatic has some uh, rare what that's talking about is rare collectible value 
And then the fourth is that it's actually slabbed. It's put in what we call a slab. And this one is done by the most reputable company out there, the PCGS company. And they put a rating on there. So that's four ways um, that this coin is gonna, has the potential to go up in value is um, the coin value, the gold value, the numismatic value, and the slab authentication value that you get with the PCG slabbing. It's interesting that um, every time there's a law written about uh, gold coins, they always exclude the numismatic gold. You go back and you read the executive order that um, Roosevelt put out in 1933. He excluded the numismatic coins from confiscation. Now, we have had confiscation before in this country, and there are uh, families that have lost inheritances to uh, confiscation laws. So. We have judicial precedent on those um, executive orders that uh, bring those things up to modern day. And uh, one day I'll do a video on some of those. But for right now, uh, we're just going to let you look it up for yourself. But we'll do, do a video on those later. But hypothetically, if there's another uh, confiscation, or if you want to increase your uh, chances of the diversification of your investment going up, this is what we do, and I'm just telling you what we do. I'm not giving financial advice. I'm just telling you what I've found when I studied this out is that the numismatic is always excluded. It's excluded. Um, you can uh, store numismatic gold in a safety deposit box, but you can't store bullion. You can uh, ship numismatic coins insured a lot easier than you can um, gold bars and whatnot. I think there's really only one way to ship um, bars, numismatic. I think it's um, the USPS. Oh, I forget the Pacific name. I'm drawing a blank. I can't remember. You'd have to research that out. But um, I know that the numismatic coins are insurable through like FedEx and, U and uh, UPS. And no, no bars or anything like that are insurable. So be sure and check in into that yourself. But all I'm saying for right now is that uh, when you do look into it, you'll find that the numismatic is insured and the numismatic is excluded from confiscation. So those are some of the advantages. And the diversification you get is um, a big advantage. Well, that's just a short video for today. We'll see if we can uh, come up with some more information for you. Like, share, subscribe. Please comment. Let me know what you think. I really appreciate and uh, value everybody's opinion. Thank you.